Pensado's Place is brought to you by... Our guests are going to show you why doing hybrid kind of mixtures can make your life successful. We got a brand new ITL. We've got great deals from Vintage King, fun stuff from Avid. You're at the place. It's Pensado's Place. Man, you've been on fire. Welcome, guys. <laughs> <laughs> My man's. <laughs> man, great to have you guys back. It's going to be a great show. I've been looking forward to this for quite a while. You, you, you know, guys, I, the only, re, only reason to have people on the show is to steal stuff, you know, steal ideas from them, so today's no <laughs> exception. And you guys, thanks for coming back. Thanks for uh, allowing us to, to do this every week for you. And Herbert? Hey, everybody. Good to see you. You know we're Absolutely. coming to you live from the Art Institute of California yes. in Los Angeles yes. from our beautiful HD studio, which stands for? Herb and Dave. Herb and Dave. Absolutely. Um, cool things from Vintage King coming up. We've got... Uh, in, in the chat room is Jacob Schneider. Say hello to Jacob. Jacob, my man. Absolutely. And I think we have a Stump the VK guy question. Dave, what do you have? Jacob, um, I'm lately having some hard drives that are about five years old. I plug them in. They don't work anymore. What what What's the procedure for hard drive maintenance and how often should I exercise them? There you go. So um, make sure you answer that question. You know you'll see that when you see the show. We'll have the answer at the bottom. This is rapidly becoming my favorite segment. It's a very cool thing. The other cool thing that Vintage King is doing, so On Your Mark gets uh, after the show, they've got a one-week special deal. You can, um, get, you can save a bunch of money on these Slate digital plugins. So the virtual console collection, the FGX mastering processor, the Trigger Platinum, can't yeah. beat that. I'll take credit for this, because I use that stuff so often that, uh, that I think I've helped reduce the price. Here are the specifics about how you do it. You can see it below me. Go to vintageking.com forward slash Pensado Deals. The promo code is Pensado Deal 2. So make sure you're vintageking.com forward slash Pensado Deals. Promo code Pensado Deal 2, 70 bucks off. Here's the deal. It's one week. Get there. It ends on March 20th. Get it. Get it done. Happy to bring it to you. Yeah. On to our avid friends. I got to tell you what's really great is the Pensado's Pose thing has just become <laughs> viral. You guys have got crazy pictures. There's, that needs to be a, a permanent segment. We are going to work on that. Look at the pictures that you see up on the screen right now, different things. You guys are so creative. So creative. Keep that going. We're going to find some ways to make sure that there's some benefits accrued. Oh, my oh God. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, I love it. We're going to save audio. I, I am, I'm working with Robert Downey Jr. Look at that. Isn't that fantastic? We love your creativity. People love your creativity with that stuff. It'll be on our Facebook page. They need to, they need to lighten up on the chemical enhancement while they're doing this. Thing. I think they should enhance this their is chemical incredible. enhancement. Really Look good stuff. That. So we appreciate it. Keep that stuff going. <laughs> We're going to do more things with that. Keep sharing, and we'll do, and we'll do that stuff. In Daba, um, you're going to be able to go to our website March 15th. Can't wait. We'll make the announcement there. So that's pensadosplace.tv. We'll make the announcement of the winner. And then later on, very shortly, we'll Skype in the winner. He'll appear on the show. So we're excited about that. Mm -hmm. Good things there. All right, enough stuff. We got great guests. We got a great into the lair. Dave, why don't you introduce that? Lately, I've been enamored with lists. So this is a list of uh, uh, five things I, I, I do every mix. If you'll run it, Will. Today we're going to depart a little bit from our normal into the layers, but I think you're going to find this, hopefully you'll find this interesting. You guys have asked for this sort of information quite a bit. Uh, I'm going to share five things I do every mix. And um, I use the word every loosely. Sometimes I don't, but more often than not, this is what I, where, where I like to start. Now, on vocals, I, I tend to start with the channel strip. It's a great, it's a great tool for repair work. It's a great tool for soft, gentle EQing. So here's, here's a song we've, we've done before, Beautiful Liar with uh, Casey Jones. Here's the channel strip. If you'll notice uh, a little bit of repair work here, um, this, this, this 1.2K, that's adding a little clarity. Normally, nine times out of 10, this would be somewhere a little higher, but 
this vocal is recorded so well it didn't really need that. So this is this is where I start. Let me play it for you. You keep talking funny little words, conjugate and turn and adjectives to verbs. It's a mystery how you survive. Okay, today's today's lesson is not about EQing. It's just where I start. Now the second thing I usually do is uh, once I get the vocals, I'll usually go for the drums, sometimes a pad or a guitar. I always start with my parallel chain in place just in case I need it. And I'd say 90% of the time I use it. So here's my, here's my snare. Here's my parallel chain up here, snare DBX. Okay, here's without it. With it. We've, we've done this before, but in case you missed it, this is a good spot to start to kind of emulate a DBX-160X, adding a little bit of mid-range, taking out a little, little heaviness, muddiness. The muddiness is probably a little higher, but for some reason I did that, so let's go with that. And then same thing on the kick. Um, here's my kick without it. Here's the kick with it. Good setting to emulate a DBX 160. Now, number three. I've hinted at this before, but I always start with my MOG EQ across the stereo bus. Uh, sometimes I take it off. You've seen a lot where I have, but I like to start. Now, on this particular song, I'm using the 500 series version, but Cliff MOG makes a great plug-in version of this, and then there's the old big one that I still use a lot. Before I, before I play without, what I'm doing is I'm adding a touch at, at, uh, at 20K, a touch at 2.5, a touch at 160, taking off a bunch of sub, I'm adding a touch at 40. Sweet talking is getting you in trouble up. Your jive walking is getting old, you're tripping up. In again. Sweet talking is getting you in trouble up. Your jive Great piece of gear, software, everything, great piece of gear. Now, number four, I've become addicted to my Shadow Hills Optograph compressor um, on vocals, on everything, but I only have one. Going back to the vocals, uh, it, it, it finds a way to get on every vocal. You keep talking funny little words, conjugate in turn. Here's without it. You keep talking funny little words, conjugate and turn the net. There's not a lot of gear that I am a proponent of just running it through the gear to, to in, improve the sound as opposed to actually do something, but this is one of those rare pieces of gear. Now, if you don't, if you, if you can't, if you can't afford the 1500 bucks for one of those, then there was a time, time when I didn't have one. Uh, just a good old solid. 1176 will work. Now, I like the Waves one, and I like the UAD E-Series e 1176. So let's, let's disengage this. Here's with. You keep talking funny little words, conjugate and turn in adjectives to verbs. And here's without. You keep talking funny little words, conjugate and turn. So now, the fifth thing I, I use on every mix is my Bricasti. Reverb. Now, I, I apologize. This is this is a a piece of gear that's pretty much out of the price range of of cats that don't do this for a living. But um, if you can afford one, you got to get one. Uh, the Bricasti is just a just a wonderful piece of gear. This is the remote for it, and uh, I use it use it a lot. I use it so much that sometimes. I'll be working on something and I'll dial in a reverb setting and then I'll print that. That way I can free the unit up to do something else. Now, if you can't afford this, a good alternative is the reverb from McDSP, some of the impulse response reverb programs. Uh, theirs is great. TL Space is great. 
Altiverb is the acknowledged leader in the space. But don't forget about the lowly little D-verb. I also use D-verb on every mix, just about every mix. If you, if you talk to Dylan Dresdo, uh, you'll find that several of his top clients really like that reverb also. So these are five things I do every mix. And uh, create your own, uh, what would really be kind of neat if you guys have your own five things list and, and put them up on, on our Facebook page. That'd be pretty cool for me to read what you guys do. Okay? Bye-bye. Our guest is going to talk about texture and atmosphere and how he takes those elements and does great stuff with the records that you love. We are happy to welcome to our table the incredible Tony Hoffer. Tony, Tony how are you, man? Hi. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Great. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Man, Tony, let's jump right in. So many records I want to learn about what you did in so little time. So, uh, um, man, I there's just something about the way you, your vocals are just in my face, like on the mm. Kooks record. Let's start there. Um, carried Away. That vocal is just, I mean, it, it goes to another county. It just so, what, what's your technique? Is it in the recording or? or um, I think. Because I don't hear a lot of room. Yeah, I mean, I, I do tend to like vocals that are that are dry. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the the when they're drier, you can get them, you can push them out more. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you still do need to put something behind them, a little, you know, a real short room or some kind of a non-linear type of reverb or a quick delay or something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I think with that, you know, it was uh, an, an eighty-seven and a Neve, you know, ten seventy-three and an LA two A. And that's how we tracked it. Michael Brower mixed that song, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and I, and I think that he he went for kind of like that that drier, close thing, which is, he, his voice sounds really good with that kind of sound. Mm -hmm. There's a um, there's a an honest but modern quality to the kick. It could almost be argued that the kick is the most important part of that 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 song. What was the process that you got that kick sounding like that? Because I mean, you must have been listening to like Lil Wayne Lollipop or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny. I um, I went to London uh, before we started the record. I went to London to work with with Luke Pritchard, the singer, and um, we did some writing together. And that was one of the songs. I brought my laptop and uh, Native Instruments machine, and you know, basically we're in a little tiny rehearsal room, just bouncing ideas off each other, and um, you know, I, I made that, that beat with some sounds that I had, some samples basically that are, uh, you know, just some gritty, you know, crunchy, you know, fat samples and just made kind of a real simple dumb beat which just sounded great with these chords that Luke had and we, you know, started bouncing ideas off each other and that was, that was pretty much it. So the oh, kick is cool. like, it's probably a few things, it's probably a few different sounds, but. Uh -huh. um, it sounds like it's got a little bit of a live component in it. There's pro one of the sounds could be like an acoustic, roomy mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. kick in there. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the choruses, you know, I, I, I do like to blend acoustic drums with electronic drums. So I think for, on the verses of that song of Carried Away, it's probably that, that loop thing, that, mm -hmm. those samples that I mm -hmm. put together. And then on the choruses, we've got Paul, I had Paul play on top mm -hmm. of that to just kind of, you know, mm -hmm. give some dynamics and open it up mm -hmm. on the choruses. And then, as a fellow guitar player, in fact, yeah. I, I, but, uh, I'm pretty sure, I can't remember, but I'm pretty sure when I saw Beck, you were playing guitar for him yeah. live yeah. last time I saw Beck, yeah. and, and the work you've done on his albums has been spectacular. Oh, thank you. The acoustic guitar on, on, on Carried Away, it's rare that I hear an instrument that gives me a a beautiful image in my mind, you know, it's like you hear, you hear, a, you hear a sound in a track and it, it sounds good, it sounds, but sometimes you hear a sound and you go, I bet that was a Taylor guitar and I bet the guy is 5-1, I bet that was recorded with, the acoustic guitar and, and, and carried away is like, it just created an image, I just mm. feel like I'm hearing the guy play it. That's the idea, yeah. And, and what did you mic it with? Um, you know what, I, I don't hear any room, it's like, yeah. And I don't hear phase, so it's only one mic. That's right, yeah. Um, the mic I use 90% of the time, maybe 95% of the time, is an SM57. Mm. 
the cheap all 57 and you know just point it right at the 12th fret a little bit of compression maybe EQ maybe not you know that the, the 57 kind of EQ it. You just kind of ruined my day. I know. It's it's actually that it's as engineers it's, we're required to use a certain minimum threshold of expensive things. I know, I know. <laughs> Set up ten mics on around the guitar, yeah, make it absolutely. look really cool. But yeah, no, it's actually, you know, it's it's like a hundred dollar mic or whatever they are. You know, it's it's uh, I just like that it kind of gives it it EQs it to, so I don't have to mess with EQ. Mm -hmm. It cuts off all the you know, the, there's not a lot of low rumble stuff with that's getting in there and uh, it really focuses the guitar, and you know, if I need some room around it, I might add another mic a little further back. But for the most part, it's it's just a 57. Great job on that acoustic. I mean, thank you. That, that's a textbook example right there. It's just, I mean, you know, you know what I'm saying? Because you did it, so I know you feel you felt it, but you just feel that this kind of. I'm not a big Pete Townsend fan, but when I hear him play acoustic, I feel like I can see him. Yeah. And I'm I don't know the guitar player in this in this song, but I just feel like I, I know what he looks like. Yeah, well, he's very good. You know, he a lot of that is also his rhythm is good. Great yeah. right hand. Yeah, great right hand. Very exactly. expressive right hand. Yeah, there's so many things about your work that I love. You're 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 fearless when it comes to panning. I mean, you just are fearless. <laughs> I mean, I love that. It's almost like you're an LCR guy. You know? Yeah. Are you? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, then you are. Yeah. On the Fratelli's um, whistle for the choir. I love the panning on that. There's mm -hmm. there's very little that's that's not hard left, hard right, or dead in the center. That's right, yeah. Uh, and I've never thought I would be a fan of that, but I'm gonna have to reconsider it after listening to your songs and, and your mixes. And of course, Brower did an incredible job on Kooks. But is that part of what you consider the elements that that that, that create the, the atmosphere and the texture that you want is, is just hard left, hard right and center? Um, well, for, for the Fratelli's thing, for that song, Whistle for the Choir, and for the whole record, um, you know, we, we did um, some pre-production before we w went in to do the record. Mm -hmm. And in the pre-production, I was kind of figuring out what, you know, how dense the songs are going to be, what, how many overdubs, what the overdubs are going to be, and where they're going to go. So when I'm doing the pre-production with the band in a little rehearsal mm -hmm. room, I'm actually kind of mixing the record in my head. Mm -hmm. Like I'm already a few steps ahead. Mm -hmm. and, that um, shows. Yeah. It really does show. And it, it helps me, you know, we, did, we were able to do that record very quickly. They had, a, they had to go on tour. We only had about 15 or 16 days to do that record. They're, they're Irish, maybe, right? They're Scottish. Scottish, Scottish yeah. What's the difference? Glaswegian. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, with that song... Um, and, and the record, I think, in general, was you know the idea was to really make each overdub, and it's mm -hmm. kind of my methodology anyway of just h how I try to do productions, just make each track count, not have eight layers of guitars and eight layers. You know, it happens sometimes. Sometimes yeah. things that I mix, yeah. they'll come to me, and there's like 150 tracks, and mm -hmm. you know, so it's sorting through everything. But um, for my productions, I try to keep stuff tight to it's where working. you can hear everything. It's and then working. the mixes sound, you know, makes the mixing definitely mm -hmm. sound better and, and it's easier to get into it. You know what I like about that song that's, that's, that's part of the creativity of your collaboration with the band, a lot of songs take you on a journey from low energy to high energy. Some songs take you on a journey from um, A to B, but this song takes you on a journey from from hip to, to old, from old to hip. It's like it's like you bring in those 30s elements, but yet mm -hmm. I never forget that I'm listening to something that was done very, very recent. Um, and the production, it, it's, it's like, it's like a, a, great, a great meal that, that, that has heat, but it's not overspiced. Right. It's just the right amount. I love that about that. Another thing is, is just like the acoustic guitar is a textbook in the Kook song, in this song, the bass is, is like, Dude, I mean, a hip hopper would be proud of that bass. Right. Can you give me a, a, a little bit of what you did to get that? Um, on that, uh, I'm trying to think. Barry used my um, P bass and um, my Fender P bass through my B15, my Ampeg B15. That's, um, that's the amp. Little flip much. top. I love yeah. those. I've got one of those. They're awesome. That, that's pretty much the only amp I use. It's for, for the studio. That's the Motown amp. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's just, it's great for the studio live. It, it's 
it's not a very loud amp, mm -hmm. but which is partially why I like it for the studio because mm -hmm. you can get a really, um, you can control it and not have leakage and mm -hmm. you know all that kind of those issues. But um, it just sounds great, and we used a lot of you know probably Sans amp and Big Muff and you know just to add grit. And I think on that song, Whistle for the Choir, it was the concept was to, you know, it's kind of a ballady type of song, but to, you know, in the end, I wanted to make sure it had a nice grit to it, and, you know, so I've got, you know, the guitar, it, which is actually not an acoustic guitar, it's actually an electric guitar that's mic'd. It was a, a harmony guitar as the main wait, guitar. Wait, I'm gonna stop you for a minute. The, the grit was on the bass? The grit was on the bass, yeah. So you used a big muff on the bass? Yeah. Okay, that's a, that's a distortion pedal for you guys that aren't familiar with it. Hendrix used a big muff, didn't he? Yeah, probably, yeah. The, the cheap little silver box. Yeah. That's but, interesting. Uh, yeah, but that you know, because the so the grit for that song, for the ballad, mm -hmm. a lot of it came from the bass because mm -hmm. there's not really a lot of electric guitars. They they come in later, but you know the the drive is coming from the bass. And here again, Little Wayne would be happy to have that on his album. It, 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 um, I know I'm moving pretty quick, guys, but I got to get these in. I want to know all this stuff. Uh, Midnight City M83. Um, that that kind of expands your palette, let's mm, say, because yeah. you, you, now you got synthesizers you can throw in. You got a lot of different things you can throw in, um, but the synths aren't corny. They're mm -hmm. like, they're just, they fit. I mean, mm. how do you get synthesizers to fit with that that power? You know. Um, well, they're cool synths. Very the, cool. Uh, my my buddy, I'm, I'm a huge. That main synth lick. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm a huge fan of, of M83s, of Anthony's, and uh, it was when I got the call to do that, my, my buddy, Justin Meldon Johnson, who I've known since I was 17, you know, so mm -hmm. a few years ago, uh, you know, we've been collaborating for years, and um, I got the call to do that, and it was like a, a dream, it was amazing, and they did a great job recording everything, it was a lot of stuff, it was synths, strings, woodwinds, brass, Electronic, you know, electronic drums, acoustic drums, choir, the, the whole day. It was a lot of stuff to wrangle. A lot of stuff. And, um, you know, I think it's just finding the, uh, like, the moments and the strengths of each song. And, you know, again, we didn't have a lot of time. There wasn't a lot of time to mix that double album. You know, I think we had maybe 10 days or something. That song's crazy. got scene changes. I mean, there are visual yeah. scene changes in that song, especially yeah. that breakdown bridgey part. That's like... Good Lord, that's like... Yeah, just so dig cool. in, you know, just... You know. Okay, I got something for you. On a lot of your songs, you tend to be more almost like a funk guy. Like like the one and the three seem to be your beat. And I, so I'm thinking, that's kind of cool, because when I think rock, I think the backbeat. I think right. the two and the four. And then I listened to the M83 song again. I hadn't heard that in a while, uh, Midnight City. And, and and you went, you went back to the backbeat on that. Do you think of you? Do you do you like that one? Because you tend to emphasize that a lot. Yeah, I do almost, like. It's funny. Almost that you say Parliament that. style. Yeah. So I'm not crazy. No, it's and I was just talking with a a, a band, this band called Mirror Talk that I'm working with right now, where uh -huh. we were having this conversation about that, where having the the twos and the fours set back. Yeah, we call it in the pocket back. In home. the pocket, yeah, just a little bit, so that. You know, and if, exactly, yeah, and if there's and if the kick is like you know, like a you know on the quarter note, like a four on the floor kind oh. of thing, mm -hmm. um, it just sounds to me it sounds funky. And I'm a huge Prince fan, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, and you know, Cool in the Gang, and, and a lot of you're a closet a lot of, hip hopper dude. I, you're yeah. a closet Parliament yeah. fan. Cameo. Absolutely, absolutely. Know, absolutely. Closet. not closet at all. Absolutely. No, like He's Zap. And, and, you know. But you know what? It all came together in that M83 song, uh, Midnight, because. The backbeat is is, is is just perfect. You yeah, know? it's perfect. And I've Thank always you. felt under certain kind of rock bands. I had this conversation with Tommy Lee, and I said, "Man, look, underneath all that Motley Crue stuff was just the funkiest mm. kind of drumming and drive and stuff." And yeah, I used to go to shows back then because there was a part of it underneath that was just so kind of black, to be honest with mm. you, you know, and, mm -hmm. it, and it, when that marriage is made, yeah, it was interesting, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It was interesting when we were talking earlier that, you know, between the sort of alternative rock space and electronica, you, 
you, you sort of merge these elements in a hybrid that make for a signature. Is that, is that planned? Is that, is that just your personal taste? Or? I think it's just my personal taste. I've, you know, I mean, I grew up with Kraftwerk and, and the Beatles and Depeche Mode and The Cure and Zeppelin yeah. and, you know, and punk bands, you know, Crass, uh, yep. you know, on and on and on. And, uh, you know, Wire, just these, these bands that are a little, some are, are pop bands, yep. some are very alternative, very left of center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it all just kind of, it's just all in me. And I, you know, I like, I've always worked on electronic music. I mean, mm -hmm. even before I was getting gigs, you know, uh -huh. like good gigs, you uh -huh. know, and I've always worked on rock music. And it's, I like bands that have always fused the two together. So I, you know, it's it's kind of that is so weird. I turned it's like a mouse, a mouse running across, you know, oh, cartoon sorry. mouse. Sorry, I swear I turned that phone off. Well, what, what's interesting to me, just you know, maybe this is the manager hat. When I look at the list of artists that you do, it, they almost have to fit your taste as opposed to you just being. Obviously, you get hired to do them, but you know, fits in the tantrums, thirty seconds to mark. You know, there's just this sort of thread through there that feels very Tony, mm. kind of. Um, and I don't know if it's because of the mixes, or, but it just, you seem to represent what you like, which is, which is a, kind of a cool thing to have in your career, correct? Yeah, well I'm lucky that I'm not, you know, uh, early on when I was talking with my manager, mm -hmm. Jeff Castellez, who, sure. you know, he's, uh, yeah. you yeah. know. Incredible. Uh, and congratulations too. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you, know, he, he, you know, he and I talked early on and I said, I don't want to just do one, th you know, rock or, or whatever, mm -hmm. and um, and I think it's it's been a natural thing. But uh, you know, I've always those projects have just kind of come to me where mm -hmm. they're you know they might be a rock thing, but the band you know they are open to having some experimenting with some electronics and yeah, um, you know, and, yeah. and or electronic bands. You know, there's some bands that I've worked with like Lady Hawk or Fisher Spooner mm -hmm. or uh, um, Goldfrap or you know where they're definitely electronic bands and they're open to some acoustic stuff. You know, mm -hmm. they haven't really used acoustic drums before merging those with electronic drums or an electric guitar with, uh, you know, all an all synth song. Right. So it's, it's kind of interesting. And, you know, and I think uh, another thing I love doing is taking the organic instruments and literally synthesizing them, like running them through synthesizers mm -hmm. through this ARP 2600 that I've got that is, mm -hmm. Is um, is amazing, you know. But you can get an electronic feel uh, on something that is soulful, you mm -hmm. know, like a bass or a guitar or a vocal or, or whatever it is or a beat, mm -hmm. and kind of man, you know manipulate it in a certain way where it. But but not lose that organic. Exactly. Exactly. Correct? Yeah, where yeah. it can sound very organic, but also very you know digital and, yeah. and hard and um, aggressive and gritty at the same time. Mm, that's brilliant. One so, of the things I've noticed brilliant. about you, Tony, that, that's actually one of my favorite things about you, when some people think, okay, I want to put a little hip hop in this song, they'll go for a sound, whereas you go for the attitude. Like, mm. like, like, like different musical genres can be defined more by their attitude than by their sonic quality. And then, and then when you decide to get a little bit of Zeppelin, you're not trying to get the sound, you just want that attitude. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. It, going back to um, Midnight City, the um, the bridge, the breakdown, guys, study that because because you set me up and I know I know it's, I knew it was coming, and you, and you give me that little ethereal, textural, atmospheric thing that Herb mentioned earlier. You get me kind of in a lull, and then you just beat me over the head with a sledgehammer at 16 bars later, and incredible. I mean, it's a textbook usage of a bridge, you know. Mm. Uh, that's not a question, that's just a compliment. Um, you get to the, um, that new guitar part that comes in the, in the vamp, I love that. What, what was the effect on that? Do you remember? Um, gosh, I don't remember. I don't remember. Probably, uh, probably a reverb, one of my, maybe a spring reverb. I'm not, to I'm not totally sure which section you're talking about. The bridge. The, the bre bridge, the breakdown, like the breakdown bit. Yeah. The breakdown bridge, um, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's probably one of my springs, probably my, my Roland, uh, my little Roland spring or my real reverb spring, something like that. Uh, you know what, I'm just now coming back to spring reverbs. I started out at a studio that had one and because it, it was a little studio, I, I wrote those off as being not good and now, uh. thanks to Tom Elmhurst and 
uh, Justin Lee back. I'm using more spring reverbs. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. This is a weird question. Um, oh, I, I remember now. I, I'm going back. I'm skipping around. Yeah. I, I, I'm trying to get all this in. Was that a dobro on Carried Away? Um, it's a slide guitar, but it has oh. that dobro y kind of sound. You know what it is? It's on the solo you're talking about. Yeah, yeah it's, um, I think what it is is actually a um, slide electric guitar run through the ARP 2600. Oh, so that's what gave it that, that boxy dobro sound. Yeah, and it's probably just plugged straight in. Like, we probably just did it in the what control room. What a great room. sound. Just literally, yeah, just straight All in. All right, I got time for Silver Sun pickups. <laughs> um, I love uh, Little Lover So Polite. What, mm. a, what a great song. Yeah. Um, there again, like, like Herb was saying earlier, your ability to take your sensibilities and who you are and merge them so seamlessly with, with, the, with the band. And here you kind of go wall of sound, but clarity wall of sound, not mush wall of sound. Uh, not like you take all your vegetables and meat and mix them all together. This was like, I love that concept. I, 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 no, no one's really done that recently with, 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 with a song like that and with a group like that. And it, it really works, mm. Con, you know, kudos to you. The guitar sound on that song, uh, that's my favorite guitar sound on any song yeah, I've ever I love, heard of yours. I love that one, Isn't yeah. that great? A lot Can of, you describe the process for our audience for that? Um, well, I mean, this, I remember the guitar on that. There was, I, was, I think I was putting in a lot of low mids. You know, a lot of people are uh, cutting out the low mids. Exactly. On, on that, I was probably, I think I was cranking a lot of low mids. Low um, mids for you is three, four, five? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 400. Okay. I, you know, I work with on uh, mainly with like API 550A EQ, so okay. that'd be 400. Yeah. You've got very specific yeah. frequencies. With the little um, white button in? Or yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. So just a so peak. Yeah, on, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, not a shelf. And um, yeah, just cranking in a lot of kind of lower mid stuff, probably blending in some low mid as well, if I remember. Um, a lot of those songs, and even on the M83 stuff, I, I sometimes, I don't know if you do this, but I, I work backwards in the songs. So I'll, I'll, I live backwards. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, a, not an issue for me. I hear you. I hear you. But, you know, like finding the, because um, uh, on, on some of the Silver Sun pickup stuff that I recall, a lot of it, you know, is very dynamic where it would start here and then by the yeah. end it's like here. Yeah. And, and with they're the They're an underrated group, aren't they? Yeah. I, I think they're oh amazing. They're amazing. But I would literally start the song at, at the end. I would start working from the, the end of the song, get that sounding oh, really good. does something like and then that. Work, then kind of work, works backwards. Work, work, work. Yeah, so that I have, I'm not working from the, be the beginning and then maxed out right. and I have nowhere to go by the time I get to the end, you know, headroom-wise. Oh, okay, I need a drum roll for this. Uh, the buzzy sound on that guitar, what was that, dude? That, that is the greatest buzzy sound I've ever heard. If there was a buzzy sound Grammy, that would win the buzzy sound Grammy. You know what I think that was? Um, I mixed that record. Dave, my buddy, old friend Dave Cooley produced that, and uh -huh. I think... Uh, it was a DI guitar plugged into this DOD um, punkifier or something. Some the red one. Uh, I'm not totally sure which one it is, but it, it's it's one. I think it's like a DOD, uh -huh. just a cheap pedal that just sounds. Are they sounds, still in business? I hate to say I that. I don't know. Don't know. That's so I have sad. a bunch of their pedals, but I don't know. I haven't. You know, I bought them all used. You, you know. know what? Qu quick question for you while you prepare for for Batter's Box. Oftentimes, guys like yourself and Dave are in a position, you're hired for what you bring to a record and what you can do. Reverse the process. So when you're doing Beck's record, what are you getting from him? Is it, are there things that, that inspire you, take you to different places? Does that process happen? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, with, with any record, there's sort of a, uh, you know, it's almost a feedback. And I, I suppose that's the thing with this art that we do with, you know, with music where, you know, you could have a bunch of people in a room, mm -hmm. a band or whatever, and there's, there's some kind of a feedback and chemistry that's happening where, you know, like if we, you know, if you start doing something, I'll react to that and mm -hmm. do something and then you react to that and then it all kind of keeps going around and you end up with something. So, you know, in the studio with Beck or with whoever, it's, it's very much, um, you know, he might start doing something and that might give me an idea for doing something, you know, adding uh, some you know, crazy, re doing something wrong mm -hmm. that is, you know, which is kind of what I'm always trying to do, something, just have something different that's, you know, different sound, 
putting a lot of, uh, you know, running the uh, acoustic guitar straight into a spring reverb, and it's just the reverb that we're getting, and put a gate on that, you yeah. know, and just something weird, and have a something trigger it maybe, you know. Mm. But um, he might be doing something that just gives me an idea mm. for something else that maybe I've always wanted to try, and if I have like eight seconds to quickly do it, then I'll try and do it, you sure. know, or not. Just put the mic on the guitar and let's go, because there's right. no time, but, right. you know. Um, and sometimes magic happens out of yeah, that process, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah definitely, exactly. the, you know, in the mistakes, a lot of cool stuff can happen, yeah. Dave, you've got your arm loosened up? I do. Are you ready? I think so, Batter's yeah. Batter's box it is. I, I was going to try to sneak in one more question, but I don't know how to phrase it. I'll get it in during the question segment. Okay, electric guitar. Uh, my favorite electric guitar, like the... Uh, the type of guitar? Whatever comes to mind. Okay, uh, a, a Rickenbacker 350. Mm. Wow, too cool. Vocals? Vocals, uh, mic-wise, either a U87 or a, an, an SM7. Oh, okay. The pointy one. Yeah, the, the James Brown mic. Yeah. Um, overheads? Um, you know, I don't use overheads a lot, actually. Um, Okay. Yeah. Uh, kick drums. Uh, definitely a 47 FET. There's no other mic. A Neumann 47 FET. I just did a shootout of different FET mics and 47 FET. Gotcha. Yeah. Yep. Have you ever tried to plug them straight into the, not going through a mic pre, but they got enough level, you can just plug them straight into the input? Oh, I'm going to try that. Yeah, it's great. Snare? Uh, 57. Cool. 257s. Okay. Switching gears, mix bus. Uh, smart C1. Okay. Uh, okay, this is a tricky one. Synth. Synth. Uh, I like to run synths through. I have this Ampeg Reverber Rocket, and um, often I'll I'll run synths through that amp in the room, and you know have get some reverb on it, maybe get a bit of a room, some some air around the synth sound if I want to sort of texturize something. And you know, put some some of that around Great idea. one or two of the sounds. Great idea. Okay, this could be tricky. I got faith in you. Monitors. Uh, Proac. Oh, okay. Studio One Hundreds. Yeah. Not okay. Tricky at all. Okay. Texture and atmosphere. Uh, you can tell I'm losing her. <laughs> texture and atmosphere. What do I think of with that? What comes to mind is I need a plug-in. I, I'm gonna make it hard on you. A Give plug-in. A um, I mean, uh, a plug-in. Got him. I got him. Echo boy. Dun, 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 dun. What? Echo boy. Oh wow. Don't don't, don't think so. I try to put the music in and everything, <laughs> make him nervous. He came through. Uh, he... Valhalla has some great reverbs as don't well. Don't they? Know. That little free that little free delay is incredible. Yeah. I was just talking to uh, Barry Rudolph about that. Love all their stuff. I do too. Whoa. Cheap too, like fifty yeah. bucks. Yeah, it's the best. Yeah, I mean, it's it's great. Great it's texture great and atmosphere. Can I toss one thing in here? Absolutely. This an observation and of 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 all the mixers, all the producers, you have a knack for using and turning dynamics into hooks. I've never mm -hmm. thought about that with any other person th that I've listened to. But when I listen to your stuff, of course, we live in a in a a little bit of a limited age, sonically, but sometimes your dynamics become what draws me into the song, which is the definition of a hook. Mm -hmm. So just compliments to you on that. Thank you very much. I, yeah, it's, in, I, it's intentional. I'm, I'm, I work hard at that. I, I can feel it, and yeah. I love it. No, I love it, because I like music that's like that as well. I yeah. like dynamics. But you're I still like loud, exciting. you're still fat. Yeah. I mean, man, you could give, you could give like hip hoppers a lesson in bass, well, let, let's keep that rolling. We got a live audience that, that has some questions. Uh, yeah, that dead audience we had yesterday. <laughs> let's introduce our wonderful producer, Mr. Will Thompson. William, how are you? Good, good. How are you guys doing? Good, 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 up, good, 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 good. You got some stuff in there for Tony? I got plenty of questions here. Absolutely. I bet. Uh, well, I'll save the M83 ones for a second. Let's just start with uh, Joe Ben Clark on Facebook is asking, what is your signal chain for tracking Beck's vocals starting with the mic? Um, we, on a lot of the vocals that we did, um, particularly on, on Midnight Vultures, um, believe it or not, a lot of those vocals were an SM58. And so 
starting with you know his voice into a 58, uh, him sitting at the back of the room on the couch, writing lyrics, throwing down ideas, and um, probably into a, uh, a Neve or an a API pre, can't remember, into probably an 1176 compressor mm. into uh, Studio Vision, I think we were using, or Pro Tools at the time, I can't remember. Mm. Fascinating. Just as a footnote, you go all the way back to Pro Tools 2-track. Yeah. SD, man. That's right, yeah. Oh, cool. Give us another one, William. All right, let's see here. Um, this one's from Martin Smith. M83's acoustic drums are an unusual but successful choice. How did you get them to fit so well into such a synthesized arrangement? Mm. Good question. Um, yeah, that is a good question. Uh, the Skill and taste. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Next yeah, question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the, um, well, the, the drums were recorded by my good friend Todd Burke, who I, who's, uh, he and I have done a lot of records together. He's a brilliant engineer. Um, so the drums were recorded really well to begin with. Um, and I think the, in terms of like gluing it all together, getting the, the electronic stuff and the acoustic stuff to sit well together, just EQing thing, you know, there's probably compression and EQ and, and that sort of stuff and just finding the sweet spot for everything. Do you ever think about the space, in other words, the program drum would have no space, whereas a live drum would have space attached from the microphone. Do you try to match those two elements at some point? No, probably not. Okay. Probably not. No, I, I'm probably wanting something a bit different oh, to get, okay. you know, have, have, have a contrast in there so that they become Perfect. one big, what, you know, thing. Yeah. And, um, you know, but I think with that stuff, with a lot of the acoustic drums, mm -hmm. for me, you know, um, I'm always trying to get my goal is to basically make acoustic drums sound like electronic drums. Like if I could have a snare to sound like, you know, a Lin snare or, 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 or a drum tracks, a sequential mm -hmm. circuits drum tracks snare, like that's pretty much all I'm trying to do. So <laughs> I think with funny. that stuff, you know, it was probably a bit of that of, you know, some gating was probably going on and, mm -hmm. and probably some distortion on the snare and the kick and, you know, and that sort of thing and, and, and compression and EQ, you know. Very cool. William? Okay, this one's from John K on uh, Facebook. Tony, I'm most curious as to your work with Supergrass. Uh, I've read that you you encourage the group to take their to keep their takes short and simple during uh, the life on other planet sessions. What was the most memorable moment of the sessions for you, and what advice do you have for creating a big full sound with minimal track count? That's a good record. Good question, John. Um, gosh, there's so many things that pop into my head, like memorable things with that record. Um, they're such an awesome band. Um, well, one thing that popped into my head was the, there's a song called Grace on that record that um, was written near the end of the record. And uh, we were working at the studio in, in, uh, outside of London called Heliocentric. And the owner, Chris Difford's daughter, Grace, would come in with uh, in these donation cans for putting you know, coins in for money for the children, to, mm -hmm. like a charity type of thing that mm -hmm. their school has them. So she would, her and her little sister would come in, Grace and her little sister would come in, and always knew that they'd, they'd get at least 10 pounds, you know, mm -hmm. of money from us. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd all be putting money in. So she'd come in every day. We'd be putting in, like, you know, probably 50 bucks, whatever it was. And um, Gaz started making a song, you know, Grace save the money for the children. Oh, Grace save the money mm -hmm. for... And I was like, man, that, that's really hooky. Like, <laughs> so I got Gaz and Danny, the drummer, to sit at the piano, mm -hmm. like, let's work this out. And the next thing you know, it was like, it was a single, you know, it did really well. Um, in terms of, what was the other part of the question with the tracks? Uh, let's see here. Um, how do you get a full sound with minimal track count? Um, that's how it works. Oh, he's lying. He, don't use, he uses a lot of tracks. <laughs> no, I mean, it's like the, the fewer tracks you have. I find, for me, like the I'm fewer tracks. With you. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, the, the, the less clutter and mm -hmm. junk there is, the, the fuller and you know the, you can make your bass bigger. You can make the you know the guitars have more room. Everything just has more room. You know the song is yeah. still the song has to work. You have to make the song work. Ult ultimately, the song will tell you what it wants. But you know I find the fewer elements in there. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, is, definitely. Is best. William. Okay, let's see. This one's from uh, Sessions Recording in the chat room. Question for Tony. What is your opinion on the current state of American rock? As you work mostly with European artists, I wondered if the upcoming U.S. artists are missing something in the rock department. Um, Interesting question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've always probably been a little more aligned with the British stuff, mm -hmm. just 
in growing up with a lot of that music, Echo and the Bunnymen, The Cure, mm -hmm. you know, Depeche Mode, um, and and all the you know the rock bands before that. Um, huge Beatles fan. Um, but with that said, I think recently there's been a lot of cool, you know, over the past six months or so, I've been noticing a lot of really cool, uh, I mean, there's always been great American music, oh, you know? Um, if there weren't, there would be no great English music because they'd just rip us off a year, a few later, <laughs> you know, five years later. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. The <laughs> Beatles, Chuck Berry on the yeah, first Yeah, that's no, true, that's true, that's true. I mean, I got friends that think the bridge invented the blues. Right. William, you got another one? Hey, can I, I throw something in real quick? Yeah. Um, I'm teasing about the British. The British, uh, their radio system and the, the, the music they're exposed to is very broad. It's not yeah. compartmentalized and fed to the children as just hip hop or just that. So their taste range is very wide, much wider than in America. Mm -hmm. So when they sit down to create and become artists, they have much fewer limitations built in than some Americans do because it's very hard to get exposed to a lot of different types of music over here. Absolutely correct. And oftentimes when you can't find your favorite band because they were hot here, they're over there or some other place where that appreciation yeah. and that, that, that love and respect I'm not is being still negative about American bands because we make the best music in the world, but sometimes we get a little like this with what we allow in a mix or in a production and sometimes it's fun to go overseas because that I'd recommend it I think where yeah. the world is going if you don't open up your blinders you are left on an island one more question for uh, for our esteemed guest here okay this one is from anonymous coward in the <laughs> chat room. <laughs> that's great Pretty appropriate <laughs> um, my question will be what kind of sonic lessons uh, that have you learned from bands such as crass or wire as you've stated before and how do you apply those lessons to your records today um, that's a cool yeah, question. Mama, tell your name. That's a great question. Yeah, whoever. That's a very cool question. Um, bands like Wire and Crass. Um, if you guys don't know those records, just, just check them out. Please. There, there's there, there's a whole education in there. Um, you know, basically with those bands, particularly Crass. You know, the Crass records they actually sound pretty horrible. They're really thin and um, they're they're somewhat difficult to listen to mm -hmm. but there's something amazing <laughs> about them it sounds like How interesting, yeah. it sounds like the the guitar has been plugged into a fan an electric fan and it just you know but it, it does create it's just diff, it's a it's a different sound and you know i kind of like that it's just it was it's it, when that came out it was different than whatever else was happening mm -hmm. commercially you know it was it was it was um has a lot of attitude and and energy and and the wire stuff you know, I mean, those are basically pop songs. A lot of those songs are, are uh, you know, a lot of them are very abstract as well. But you know, they're they're very good at having pop songs, but wrapped up with weird, you know, colors and flavors. You know, on drum sounds that are very dry, but with like lots of slap on them, and um, y you know, just trying to do something different, trying to just freak people out basically with with their band. Mm. Is, you know, so mm. um, wow. yeah. Now we have to we have to address one slight problem. Um, I don't know Jeff, so the problem that he's going to have is me calling him all the time to book you for stuff that we're doing. So please let him know the tsunami's coming. All right, definitely. Can, yeah. can we can we it, 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 impress upon you the need to come back and share Absolutely. with us? I'm, I'm already here. Oh, cool, and man. And I'll be here next. <laughs> whenever you call, I'm there. Yeah. Tony, totally. thanks. Man, Tony. Thank what you a so pleasure, much. man. What an thanks. absolute pleasure. Absolutely. Dave, wrap us up. Send us home. Whew, guys, we, we, yeah, I'm not bragging enough, but we got a lot in. I got a lot of my questions answered about some of these great things that uh, Tony has been involved with. Um, inspirational. Go back and listen to this again. Follow some of the, the bands that Tony talked about. And uh, I, think, um, I think you can learn a lot from listening to his records. I, I know I did. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rethink quite a few things on my next mix. So thanks for hanging out with us, and we'll see you next week.